Hello, everyone. We hope you are well. We just wanted to give you all a little sneak peek into our newest release on Patreon. That is a three-part series on the Ken and Barbie killers. So if you're curious about Patreon, stay tuned afterwards for an explanation of what the heck it is and how you can sign up. And a Nick warning. Heads up, (laughs) this story is a little more violent than the ones Muriel usually tells, but a bunch of people requested we cover these monsters, and the cool part of Patreon is we try and pack it with listener suggestions. So here we go, baby. Yes, and just a quick content warning. This episode involves sexual assault and torture, and it does involve minors. So as the theme song kicks in, which you should be hearing right now, Please turn us off if this kind of story is wrong for you. Listener discretion is advised. We're starting this story in early January 1993. Mm -hmm. It's wintertime in Ontario, Canada. All right. The night of January 5th in St. Catharines, Ontario had dipped just below freezing. Fog and clouds blocked out the moonlight. It had been misting all day and windless. The neighborhood, Port de Lucie in St. Catharines, sits on the southwestern bank of the smallest of the Great Lakes, Lake Ontario. If you took a two-minute walk from the shores of Lake Ontario in Port de Lucie, you'd find yourself stumbling upon a white two-story craftsman-style rental house on a leafy corner lot. I feel like are you intentionally trying to scare me already. Yeah, it was. <laughs> All the cold stuff got me scared. Then you started talking about a little house, and I was like, oh, okay, whatever. But then I remembered horrible things happen in little houses. Yes. And I know you're not telling me this like little houses where they like made all the cookies for the bake sale that did really well for the church. It's a really, it's a pretty horrific story. Yeah. All right. On January 5th, 1993, a car idled in the driveway of this house, ready for a trip to St. Catherine's General Hospital. Inside the house, a horrifically battered 22-year-old woman named Carla Hamolka desperately dug through the rooms, searching for a set of videotapes. Mm -hmm. After coming up empty-handed, Carla relented and allowed her mother and sister to drive her to the hospital. (sighs) Attending physicians later said that night, Carla was suffering from one of the most violent cases of domestic violence they had ever seen. Carla's husband, Paul, had beaten her with a heavy flashlight and stabbed her with a screwdriver. She had bruising over most of her body, swollen legs, cuts, and puncture wounds. Carla's eye sockets were a shocking black purple from her eyebrows down to the tops of her cheekbones. She had an injury that's called raccoon eyes. So those are dramatic, dark black eyes that are actually caused by violent blows to the back of the head. Oh, damn, Muriel. Carla reported the attack to police who arrested her 29-year-old husband, Paul Bernardo, and then released him on bail just a short time later. Mm. Carla was hospitalized until January 9th, so she was hospitalized for four days for her injuries after which she left St. Catharines with her aunt and uncle, Patricia and Calvin Seeger, who lived about an hour away in Brampton, Ontario. Is that like a safety measure? Like you're, we're, we're getting you out of town? I assume so. Okay. Because yeah, all of her family lives in St. Catharines. Yeah. Using legal aid, Carla found a lawyer and she filed for divorce from her husband of two years just a few days later. Good. So... Carla and Paul's story began in the fall of 1987 at a hotel bar in Scarborough, Toronto. Mm -hmm. So Carla Homoka was this bubbly, cherubic 17-year-old with like short, you know, sassy, curly brown hair. (laughs) Yeah. She was into animals. She wanted to be a veterinarian when she got older. And at the time, Carla was working at the number one pet center in St. Catharines, Ontario. Her bosses planned a trip to Scarborough for some pet convention thing. And they let Carla and another girl who worked at the shop 
tag along. Like, here's a big girl thing. Come do this thing with us. Okay, so it's the name of it is number one pet center. Yes. Or you're just saying like out of all the pet centers, like this one was number one. Honestly, that got me too. But no, that's the name <laughs> of it. I was like, okay, that's number. They said it in the documentary. And yeah. I was like, all right, lady. Okay, all right, yeah. So, but it's a pet store. <laughs> yeah, it's like a pet store. Okay. <laughs> So after the group checked into their hotel, Carla and the other 17-year-old girl or teenage girl snuck out of their room and down to the bar of the hotel to see what they could get into. Mm -hmm. At the bar, Carla locked eyes with a blonde-haired, blue-eyed hunk, Paul Bernardo. Paul Bernardo was an accounting student in his early 20s. He was from Scarborough, but he was there attending a convention in town as well. So he's at the bar like schmoozing it up. Sure. People describe Paul Bernardo in lots of ways. I think right off the bat, he seemed like an American psycho knockoff to me. <laughs> That's just based <laughs> on pictures and the way he speaks, but whatever. So what does that mean? Like chiseled and sort of like a uh, clean cut and really, I don't know, by the book. Not in the way, like, I don't know. I think, Think American Psycho, but like a guy who's a lot friendlier and like nicer, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, but very like clean cut, handsome. You know, we'll talk about that. Basically, like I said, he's the kind of guy where like if I was in my 20s and I met him at a bar, he would probably make me like Homer Simpson into the bushes. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, this sounds like the kind of American Psycho that you would be scared of. Like the real American Psycho, you'd be like, oh, what are you, like a cold-blooded Psycho? Okay, <laughs> I could deal with that. And if some guy's like, hey, I'm super chill, you're just like, he, he's more. He's way more up than that. Like a uh -huh. type he's like, hey, buddy, how's it going? Oh, like that right. kind of guy, right? Okay. But apparently he was pretty disarming. Physically, he's like blue-eyed with a manicured look, stylish, short, soft, curly hair with peroxide blonde tips. Remember? Okay. It's 1987. Nice. He's fit, flawless skin, perfect white chiclet teeth, like the full, <laughs> you know, whole, full nine yards. Okay. Yeah, he's like a good old Canadian American psycho. Exactly. Okay. Real type A, alpha dude. Friends used to say he used very precise language when speaking, so he never said any ums or ahs or like. <laughs> uh, he always made really intense eye contact. Gross. One thing that stuck out for me, apparently when he met someone, he'd do that thing where you make a big clap and then jam out your hand for a handshake. So you're like, hey, buddy, what foot are there? Like that kind of thing. <laughs> You couldn't even do it. That's how far removed you are from that kind of person. Like your act out right there was so much less precise than your act outs usually are. And I think I'm being crappy. The thing is, is like, if that's your thing, that's totally fine. I think yeah. it's just when you try to force people to do stuff. You know what I yeah. mean? That's how he seems. Like, high five. No, we always give high five. Exactly. It's like we actually don't always do anything. Yeah. But if you were like, hey, high five, buddy. And I was like, no. And then you were like, hey, no problem. Different strokes, man. I'd be like, let's go hang out. <laughs> yeah. Like, Actually, how about a low five? Yeah, I got I'll, some be, good friends I'll like meet it. you halfway in the middle. Uh, yeah, I was just like picturing. I uh, said I, what I wrote was, I know that sounds judgy, uh, but you know I'm right because picture two people doing it to each other and how annoyed they'd be. Yeah, they yeah. both tried to take control. You know what I mean by being like, put her there, buddy. And it's like, no, buddy, put her there. You I put her there. Think, I think that'd be pretty funny. They're just like clapping at the same time and canceling each other out. Exactly, just getting pissed. I was really just that's exactly what I was picturing. So <laughs> Paul's big goal was to be an accountant at Pricewaterhouse with the goal of making six figures a year, which was a lot back then. That's like over a quarter million dollars in today's money. Give me six figures right now, please, please, please. Six figures is still a lot of money. Well, I'm manifesting. <laughs> okay. Well, it also made me realize I don't know anything about real people jobs. Like... <laughs> I was like, that's a lot of money, right? Like, I did not know accountants made that much money. That's hell of money. Uh, but mostly, Paul was just kind of vaguely all about being famous. Like, the center of attention, destined for greatness. Uh -huh. He was into j designer clothes, nice cars, money, his personal success. He was into luxury items mm -hmm. and gadgets. Like, he was one of the only people in his circle to have a camcorder, which was an invention that was had only been around for a few years at oh, the time. Oh man, you already said this case involves a bunch of tapes. So he's up I to I thought no I was good. sewing it in subtly. No, you're not. <laughs> Wait, hold on. <laughs> 
No, man, we have Patreon people. Everyone's requesting this, and they're all a bunch of sickos, you know? No, I do have a question for you, Muriel. You said he's chasing fame, but not to split hairs, but really what he sounds like is he's chasing popularity. Yeah, I think Not like, like fame, fame. No, when I say vague, I mean, like, if you listen to what people have to say about him at the time, he uh-huh. kind of has no distinct goals of being, like, a famous actor, uh-huh. but a distinct sort of... Uh, vague references to being well known you know like if it's not fame it's like in Scarborough I'm the best accountant at Pricewaterhouse you know what I mean just like, walking around with his camcorders like hey you got one of these give yeah. her there <laughs> what do you say you want to get on my movie right okay yeah I mean he's kind of like me it's like can I just can someone recognize that everything I do rules I recognize that. About Thank you, Muriel. So he has a camcorder like we talked about. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of video footage from around that time. Paul used the camcorder all the time, taping Carla and her family, taping himself. And it's always kind of these goofy, candid videos, like exactly what you'd think. You're, people are talking, then you're staring at someone, then you zoom into their face, and it's just like their nose and the top of their mouth and their eyes, and then you just ask them a bunch of dumb questions like, hey, hey, <laughs> what are you doing? I'm just drinking a Coke. Oh, really? Do you like your Coke? Yeah. Where'd you get that Coke? I don't know. What are you talking about? <laughs> you're crazy. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. No, no. Just answer truthfully. There's no way this footage will ever end up in a documentary about me. <laughs> I mean, it's just like the kind of thing that you would always see in like early 90s home videos. Yeah, of course. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you videotaping? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, we were just out at the beach with a friend of ours who's a photographer and a father, and he was taking so many photos that his darling daughter was just like oh my god dad you're so annoying she's like eight (laughs) (laughs) so he carried it around him all the time Mm -hmm. obviously kind of like a vanity thing and like you know your thoughts are big enough about yourself that you feel like you have to document all the random dumb stuff you do right yep Mm -hmm. i can relate so the night they met paul and carla hooked up in paul's hotel room and they didn't leave each other's side for the next six years. Wow. It was a heavy, like, quote unquote, romantic romance, like expensive presents, dates, like very performative courting, that kind of you uh-huh. know, classic, like, 80s style romance. You know? Yeah, he's like, you're 17. I'll pick you up from high school in my Porsche. <laughs> That's not really that far off from what happened. So mm. Paul's a sharp and classy dresser. Think... Zach from Saved by the Bell, preppy sweatshirts, chinos, press jeans, whatever. Carla started out a totally average high school kid, Mm -hmm. but she quickly morphed to match Paul, who bought her things like designer outfits. She grew out her hair. She went platinum blonde and straightened out all her curls. She dropped a ton of weight. She was already a pretty small gal, Mm -hmm. a little over five foot. And after she met Paul, she became very, very thin and After her transformation, she had that classic 80s sort of poodle look, big teased bangs, sleek long hair, heavy eyeliner, pink lipstick. Mm -hmm. On the home videos Paul made, you know, in terms of her personality, at least with Paul, like her friends talk about her being this really bubbly, enthusiastic, happy girl. Yeah. On the videos with Paul, she's very soft spoken and deferential. She really often speaks in this purring baby voice, which she also, you know, spoke and behaved that way at trial. So every public every public videotape that you see of her, she kind of has that affectation. When people talk about what she was like before she met Paul, it's a very different personality, but we don't have video of that. Um and she would call him stuff like Uncle Paul, you know, I don't relate to it. I don't relate to it. Teach their own. You got a big age gap, but it would be like, I'm a baby and you're Uncle Paul. That oh, oh no. Okay. All right. In the beginning, Paul would drive an hour and a half from Scarborough to St. Catharines to visit Carla at her parents' house. Carla's parents, Dorothy and Carl, were charmed by this handsome, mature go getter, and they allowed Paul to spend the night on his visits because it's such a long drive. 
At first, he was banned from sleeping in their teenage daughter's bed, although he snuck in anyway after dark. But eventually, her parents dropped the pretense and the couple openly shared a bedroom. Mm -hmm. And on Christmas Eve, 1989, 19-year-old Carla Hamulka and 25-year-old Paul Bernardo got engaged to be married. By the fall of 1990, Carla was working as a vet technician and Paul, who had lost his apprenticeship at Pricewaterhouse, moved into her family home in St. Catharines. Oh, with the parents. Yes. Then that year, in 1990, at Christmas time, Carla's 15-year-old sister, Tammy, died in a freak accident. During a Christmas party at the family home, after having several drinks, Tammy passed out, choked on her own vomit, and died. What? Really? Yeah. Hold on. Time out. No. In January 1990... (laughs) I don't get to ask any follow-ups. R.I.P. That's horrible. In January... There's a lot worse things that are going to happen. Oh. In January 1991, (laughs) after Tammy's funeral, Carla's parents asked Paul to move out and give the family space to grieve. Yeah. So outraged, Paul vowed never to return to the house, and he left. So it was a big rift in the family. Uh-huh. He lived in a series of motels in the area until finally renting an expensive two-story home a block away from the shores of Lake Ontario in Port de Lucie. So they're just engaged at this point. They're not married. Yes. Okay. It seemed like an expensive choice for a young couple, a nice house just a couple blocks away from the lake in an exclusive neighborhood, and even more so given that Paul had actually lost his position at Pricewaterhouse. So yeah. they didn't seem to have, I mean, Carla was just a, a veterinary assistant. They didn't seem to have a ton of money. So he's out. just unemployed. He didn't go start flipping burgers They're or something. They're not sure what's going okay. on with him. We just know he's not working at this place that he thought he was going to make six figures sure. at, right? And around this time, Paul became more restrictive and controlling with Carla. He moved her into this new rental. He banned her from driving. He would drive her everywhere. He banned her from going out with friends or coworkers. And he made her leave work at exactly when she was done. She had to account for every minute of time that she was doing anything. Oh, God. Monitored her schedule, did that whole thing. But Carla gushed about the relationship, how wonderful Paul was, how romantic he was. And although no one really knew where he got his money or even if he had a job, you know, she was excited about how he splashed money around. You know, he was still able to afford this high-end lifestyle, the expensive rental, the designer clothes, nice cars and gifts for Carla. So Mm -hmm. all in all, she still felt very taken care of. Like, for instance, here's a great example. Paul bought her a purebred Rottweiler puppy Mm -hmm. that Paul couldn't stand and often (laughs) locked in a crate in Um, the basement. Okay, cute. Okay. On June 29th, 1991, six months after Tammy's death, Paul and Carla married in a lavish ceremony. Carla had seven bridesmaids, a horse and carriage to escort them to the ceremony, everything, like the whole nine yards, like a royal wedding pretty yeah. much. Mm-hmm. And after their marriage, Carla started showing up to work with bruises that she had attempted to cover up with makeup and long sleeve <sighs> shirts. Mm-hmm. She said the injuries from were from accidents, so falling down and bumping into things, but it seemed pretty clear she was in trouble yeah in mid-june 1992 carl briefly left paul staying with her parents but quickly returned to her husband a few days later and then everything came to a head in january 1993 when paul brutally beat her with a flashlight and co-workers and family convinced carla to leave the marriage yeah so now back to 1993 carla is living in brampton with her uncle and aunt Paul is out on bail, living at their rental home in Port de Lucie. And then this sad, awful situation gets way, way crazier. Mm. On February 1st, 1993, just a few weeks after Carla was discharged from the hospital, Metro Police received some surprising news. Ontario's Center of Forensic Science revealed the results of a long-forgotten DNA test taken two years prior. 
And that concludes our sneak peek into the newest trilogy. Every once in a while, we are reminded that people don't know what Patreon is or they don't realize why signing up helps this podcast so much. So we're going to break it down for you. Patreon, guys, is a website that helps you give us $5 a month and in return gives you access to a back catalog of episodes you can't hear anywhere else and gives you access to two new exclusive episodes each month plus one non-true crime episode a month, which is just Muriel and I, you know, just hanging out. <laughs> to unlock all three episodes of the Ken and Barbie killer story in its entirety, please hit up the Muriel's Murders Patreon. You can find the link in our show notes. You can find the link in our social media bios. You can download the Patreon app and just search for Muriel's Murders. Or you can type in, ready for it? www.patreon.com slash Muriel's Murders. That's it. Into the <laughs> mystical internet and you shall find us. So not only will you unlock the Ken and Barbie Killers trilogy, you'll unlock four Muriel's Murders episodes we recorded way back in 2020 before Muriel's Murders was its own official podcast. You'll unlock 16 back episodes of Muriel's Murders and you'll gain access to all future Patreon only episodes. Included in this treasure chest of back episodes you'll be able to binge our episodes about the Nexium sex cult. The Heaven's Gate cult. The poop obsessed millionaire John McAfee. That was a good one. Our m- most first hand detective episode episode we've done so far about the erasure of a is that how you say that word erasure erasure of a murder that happened in the remote mexican paradise village of yalapa that's where muriel and i were vacationing because we were stuck in mexico with covid then we stuck around yalapa for a little while and realized it was super shady muriel did some digging we did a whole episode about it yeah i got real scared after the second person ghosted me i was like "Mm, (laughs) i don't know if i'm nancy drew enough for this all right the life career and tragic murder Murder of Bay Area rap legend Mac Dre. Nick did that one. The sprawling saga of a rich kid named Kathy Boudin, who along with a bunch of other rich white kids started the deadly revolutionary group, The Weather Underground. A history of ice pick lobotomies. I'm telling you though, that Mm -hmm. was a good one. I like that one. (laughs) These are all good, man. The Mensa Murders one, that was a hit. Yeah, and of course, the Ken and Barbie Killers trilogy in its entirety. So for five bucks a month, which is kind of like tipping us less than a dollar an episode that allows us to keep putting out free episodes every Wednesday it helps us pay for editing software equipment upkeep research subscriptions and all the other things we need and it's a gigantic morale booster for Muriel and I and if you want to help us with the show please hit up our Patreon or visit www.murielsmurders.com slash support to learn about ways to help that don't involve money thank you so so much for listening we love you. 